Welcome everyone to uh, this Wednesday night and today we are talking about the psychotherapeutic potential of psychedelics and uh, I'm very excited for um, for this event tonight we have a very uh, very special guest today which I will introduce in uh, in a short notice but first before we start I will uh, I want to let you know a couple of things about uh, this evening um, there will be a presentation by Sergio uh, which will take uh, between 20 and 30 minutes. Uh, and after that, we will have a discussion. And I want to invite you to also ask your questions. In the line down below, you see a button with Q&A. Please don't hesitate to ask all the questions you have. And uh, you can also upvote each other's questions. So if you see a question that you think is, um, is interesting or a question that you wanted to ask yourself, don't hesitate to give a thumbs up and then uh, we, will, uh, we will see it and we will try to, of course, answer all of your questions. So before the start, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Sergio Perez and he's the director at Mind European Foundation for Psychedelic Research. He's there, the director of the Mind Academy. And he's also a medical doctor and he works in intensive care, anesthesiology and emergency, emergency care. Well, he has been interested in the topic of consciousness for uh, his entire uh, professional career. And of course, the emerging field of psychedelic assistance psychotherapy is his main interest. Uh, it is a possibility to unlock a new understanding of different mental health disorders and their treatment methods. Sergio, I want to give the floor to you. Good evening, Laura. Thank you very much for this warm welcome. Thank you, everybody. Nice to have you here. Nice to see you here. Um, yeah, I'm just going to start sharing my screen and I think we'll just get right to it. So, Today, tonight, we are going to be talking about the therapeutic potential of psychedelics. But first, a couple of words to me. Mm, I'm Sergio Perez, I'm a medical doctor. As Laura already said, I'm uh, working full-time in anesthesiology, intensive care and emergencies. And I'm the director of the Mind Academy. I've taken lead in the drug science program, which uh, searched to uh, educate the public um, and academics around the knowledge around these substances. We also have the elements of science, which are short informative clips um, with, uh, yeah, with the ess essential information around the subject. I'm also a beyond experience facilitator, which is our self experiential integration workshop. And we are also developing the new augmented psychotherapy training which is um, a training in how to use altered states of consciousness in psychotherapy. So uh, for the announcement, stay tuned. At the end of the month, we will be announcing this uh, very exciting new training. Now, this year, I will be also starting the psychotherapist um, training. So I'm very excited about that as well. Um, now, the main subject in this um, talk will be psychedelics, but also a little bit of history around uh, psychiatry and this yeah, very fascinating substances. What I want is that at the end of this uh, presentation, you be able to uh, read and understand what this uh, phrase says, certain energetic psychedelics produce long-lasting anxiolytic and antidepressive effects through the activation of the 5-HT2A receptor. This talk will consist in three parts. Uh, at the first, the first part, we will talk about the background, the history of psychiatry, and the relevance of this subject. Then we will take a short look about what are psychedelics. And at the third part, the most interesting one, why you all are here tonight. Um, we will talk about the therapy and the future of this field. So, 
mental health, mental health illnesses. Why is it important? Why is it a uh, raising relevant uh, subject? For our one in four will be affected by mental health problems at some point in their life worldwide. 25% of all Europeans suffer from depression and anxiety each year. And it's a total of 2.4 billion humans that are affected by the mental health epidemic. If you think about it, that's two, four, and 11 zeros after that. Taking all this into account, it might not come as a surprise that uh, mental health disease is expected to rank second uh, after heart disease in 2020. And this was all before we knew about the COVID pandemic, which leads to isolation, to financial instability, and other things that can um, lead to an increase in mental health illnesses. Before we jump, jump into, the, into the real subject, uh, let, let, let me take you through a short, short walk through psychiatric history. We only started treating psychiatric patients in the middle 19th century. Before that, they were all just locked away and it's like, okay, then you don't, you don't uh, belong to society anymore. And in the 20th century, we became very creative in the way that we wanted to treat this, um, these illnesses. For example, one of the, the first ideas we had was hydrotherapy. Uh, the main idea was taking um, very, very cold water, putting uh, ice, um, uh, ice water in, in bathtubs, and then shocking pace, patients into sanity. Of course, we don't do that anymore. And well, I guess he didn't got the memo. Some of, uh, of the treatments um, like the insulin coma therapy had a mortality to up to 10%, which is a very, very high rate if you think about what we were all doing. And yeah, the most, the, most probably you already have heard about the lobotomy. Lobotomy was the idea that an ice pick through your nose into your frontal lobe was a good idea to uh, treat mental illnesses. This kind of worked, but it just made you kind of a non-thinking zombie that was just calm all the time, so no uh, personality left whatsoever. And all this time, all this, it's, it's uh, interesting and uh, relevant to mention that all this time was ruled by psychoanalytic theory. There was no medication and cognitive behavioral theory and other uh, schools of thoughts were just in their um, baby steps. It was until 1952 with the discovery of serotonin in the brain that we changed the way to uh, see and treat uh, mental illnesses, um, and that was the start of the so-called SSRI era and the era of mo modern psychiatry. Uh, the first SSRI was discovered by, in 1958 by Roland Kuhn. For those of you that don't know what an SSRI is, um, it's a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, uh, and some of the most commons be common common name names for them being, for example, Prozac, I'm, her, I'm pretty sure you've heard of it, or Solof, or Citalopram, depending on where you come from, you've probably heard of from uh, about one of these antidepressants. Now, what happened uh, with, with, or what is this, this uh, molecule and why is it so important? Well, serotonin was discovered actually in 1937 already by a Roman um, researcher and scientist called Vittorio E. Pramar, and he called it entramine. The highest amounts of serotonin are found in the gut, and its function is to um, create a contraction in the muscle cells in the intestines, and therefore generate the peristaltic, which transports food through the intestines. Um, she had a, uh, she, uh, he had a very um, big group and they were very successful in what they were doing. And they were not thinking about looking for this, um, 
looking for this molecule in the brain. It was until, it was in 1952, uh, where Betty Torok had the idea to investigate these different organs and, their, um, and see if there was any amount of this molecule somewhere else. Her mentors back then told her that she was wasting her time. She would not find anything in the brain. She did it anyway. And there you go, she found serotonin in the brain. This was the first step to bring in serotonin in the, into the field of neuroscience. But back then, serotonin had no role or effect in mental health, or so they thought. The, the effects they, they related to serotonin back in the day, even in the brain, were related to vasoconstriction or muscle contraction. Around the same time, there was a chemist called Albert Hoffmann um, from Switzerland that originally was studying ergot poisoning, looking for a medication for blood pressure and vasoconstriction. And in 1943, he took a dose um, of, 20, of 250 micrograms um, of this substance and made a journey with his assistants on the bicycle, like it was usual at that time, uh, driving home. On that journey trip, he experienced uh, very unusual uh, changes in perception of time, of space, and introspectively speaking, uh, on his sense of self and emotions. Later, he categorized these effects to be, um, to be similar to the state of consciousness that people uh, suffering from psychosis, psychosis must live in. He proposed it to, the, to his colleagues and friends to use this substance to study the, sta uh, the states of psychosis. And he also had the intention that psychiatrists to take this substance themselves to later have more empathy and compassion when treating patients with psychosis. In 1947, um, uh, a company called Sandoz, now called Novartis, uh, made this substance commercial and called it a delicid. Um, which what what followed was a whole time, a whole era from the 1940 to the 1970s of extensive research around these substances. It was used um, to tr well ha having the psychiatrist take the substance to um, generate more empathy and compassion towards their patients was the first step. What he was what. Well, he was not expecting was the, that the psychiatrist who took the substance discovered something way more interesting than just a psychotic state. They started, started to experience a decrease in everyday, uh, everyday worries and rumination, and some of them also report having experienced a sense of inner peace. Having experienced these outcomes, psychiatrists began treating several mental illnesses with positive results in the fields of alcohol addiction, anxiety, depression. They used them to facilitate psychotherapy. Uh, back then, a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, thinking that it turned resistance down and made psychoanalysis easier. And they didn't stop taking it themselves, so it, was also used recreationally and to en enhance creativity. So why is this important? Why is this all important? It is important because later, this scientist called Dilworth Wayne Woolley, who was investigating LSD, recognized a, a molecular similarity in serotonin and LSD. Calling, it, uh, calling LSD an anti-metabolite of serotonin. And since LSD had such potent effects on perception and emotion, could it be that serotonin, a molecule similar to LSD, could play a role in our emotional state and regulation and mental illness? Later in 1954, he and his partner proposed a role of serotonin in mental illness which led to uh, the current state of a modern psychiatry, because without these two things put together, then we would still think that serotonin in the brain is uh, mere 
use is to generate vasoconstriction and to regulate muscle contraction. So psychedelics basically have been there since the beginning of uh, this fascinating field of psychiatry. Interestingly enough, D.W. Woolley suffered from diabetes and by 1939, he was almost blind. And well, his many friends uh, still sp spoke about the ability for him to see things, apparently because he worked very hard at creating his own visual impressions, taking as much information as he could through other senses and listening to the descriptions of others and grasping a molecule um, of, of serotonin and a molecule of LSD. He actually recognized and felt that these molecules were similar. What does this mean? If you take a look at the molecules of LSD and serotonin, you actually don't have to be a scientist to recognize the similarity in this molecule. For all that uh, woolly matter, you don't even have to see to recognize this. So this, is, um, this was the first part. It was a lot to take in, I know, but now it comes to the more exciting part, the part where we're going to talk about psychedelics. But first, I want to talk uh, about how we got there. Now, with all these discoveries, new information, emerging tools of psychotherapy, emerging methods of neuroscience, um, because of the historical, situative, and polit political reasons that we will not have time to for further explore in this talk, the path that psychiatry took into modern psychiatry was based on the so-called monoamine hypothesis. Now, the monoamine hypothesis has this, this model. If you take a look at this column, it's a representation of uh, two neurons, one with, a, with an axon and one with a dendrite. And what you, you see here, it's called a synaptic cleft. These neurons communicate through so-called neurotransmitters, which serotonin has been found to be one. Now, on, on the one side, you see that we have these bubbles, yeah, filled with the neurotransmitter, in this case, serotonin, and they then um, merge with the cell and then get into this synaptic cleft activating the receptor, the so-called 5-HT receptor, and then transmitting the signals between the neurons. The hypothesis um, of, of, the, of the monomine theory is that the depressive patients don't have enough monomine, um, monomines or serotonin in this synaptic cleft, as, as you can see in the second uh, picture. Uh, there is a lack of it, and with the development of the first serotonin reuptake inhibitor, blocking the channels, which is the, the third third part, blocking the channels to uh, stop the reuptake of this molecule back into the cell, uh, increased the amount of serotonin in this synaptic cleft, which. Back in the day, when they tried out the first antidepressant, they didn't know that it was working this way, but it led to this hypothesis um, so that they just fixated it in there and um, thought that this would be the way that we can cure depression. It actually worked. It has some kind of um, effect, which is why psychiatry took, took this, this uh, this idea of just producing more and more of this kind of, um, of drug. And we can sum up that low, the, the hypothesis says that low serotonin levels lead to depression and blocking this reuptake of the, of the serotonin increases the serotonin in the cleft uh, leading to less depression. The problem, 
is that since um, the first the first um, ser serotonin reuptake inhibitor came to the market in 1987, there has been an increase in the prescription rates ever since. And given this um, neuro, neurotransmitter reuptake inhibitors blockers, antidepressants leads to a permanent, permanent prescription of this antidepressants. So what you generate are patients that always and every day need to take a drug that might or might not help them. Now let's take a short look at the efficacy of the treatment with these SSRIs. The data in the studies says that 20% and only 20% of the patients treated with antidepressants has a long-term remission. Also, the compliance is low, meaning that people just don't like taking the pills every day. The side effects, which are very, very, there are a lot of them. There's many, many side effects, which start uh, almost at the beginning of taking the medicine. And also the positive effects of this, of this uh, antidepressants is delayed 15 to 30 days. This activation of the 5-HT2A receptor seems to be context, context sensitive. What does this mean? Uh, this is basically, this means basically that if you give someone in a loving environment full of support and family and everything that you need to get better an antidepressant, it actually helps a lot and it can be very very beneficial for this uh, patient but if you don't have someone with the um, the luxury of having a supporting environment and stability in their and their home this context sensitivity leads to pretty much no to a worsening of the depression so no symptom relief or even worsening of depression this treatment well, as I already told you, leads to dependency. People having taken antidepressants for years when they try to, uh, to stop taking them experience withdrawal symptoms, which is becoming more and more common if you remember how many people are suffering from depression and how the prescription rates are rising um, very fast. Another study even showed that the placebo group that responded even better to to the treatment with placebo than the non-responder group that was treated actually with uh, an active ingredient, leading to the treatment with another active ingredient, with another SSRI, which means that we are creating ourselves therapy-resistant depression at the end. Now, classic psychedelics and the paradigm shift that they might bring with them. This is the most interesting part. What are classic psychedelics? Let's try to define what they are. Classic psychedelics are serotonin-like substances that act as agonists, like activators, in the 5-HT2A receptors. Some of these substances include LSD, as um, already told you, isolated by Albert Hoffman, but actually a natural compound found in ergot, also uh, psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, which has a very um, long and, and, and yeah, long history in ritualistic and shamanic use in several cultures in Central and South America. We also have the mescaline, um, which uh, comes from as an active ingredient in psychoactive cacti, which you might know uh, from uh, native religious use in na Native American tribes. And uh, we have also dimethyltryptamine. This is the active ingredient in the ayahuasca brew. The ayahuasca brew used by shamans in South America to communicate with nature and the spirits and possibly heal mental health problems in their tribes. Right. So this is your brain. And this is your brain in drugs. You, in the psychedelic renaissance, which Led, led to uh, brain imaging with and without psychedelics. 
Here you can see the um, results from a study from 2016 where participants were given either a placebo or LSD and then taken into an MRI. Not the best context in which to take this substance, if you ask me. But as you can see, there is a difference in activation and the neuronal communication between the placebo and the LSD group. On the upper row, you can see that only parts of the brain are being activated, whereas down there where, where LSD was administered, you see a, a vast reaction and a lot of entropy and change generating novel patterns of neuronal communication. But not only that, not, the image is not only the, the, the important part of this study because participants also started reporting um, a decrease in fear, a sense of peace, a unit, uh, sense of peace and sense of unity, decreased rumination. Uh, and of course, they also experienced some uh, perceptional changes like seeing uh, differently and hearing more intensively and so on. Another study pictured its reports on these two graphics. The circle represents the brain, the different dots are the brain regions, and the colors represent networks that normally interact and exchange information with each other. As you can see, in the placebo group, the normal state, you see that these networks, even different colors, sometimes communicate and exchange information with other networks. Um, this study showed how under psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, networks started to interact more with, a not one, with each other, integrating information in, a, in more than one way, making the brain regions more connected and therefore making sense in a more informed way than ever before. This also explains some of the special effects that these substances can create, like synesthesia. Synesthesia is the, uh, is the word fancy word for merging of the senses, like seeing sound or even hearing color. But not only that, having a higher connectivity sometimes leads to better understanding in one's emotions and past experiences. So we uh, started to further look into these substances and trying to figure out what was happening there, if this is a, something that we can use in a therapeutic context. And to, 2016, a study by Carrot Harris um, studied this, the efficacy in treatment-resistant depression that psilocybin might and could have. They took 12 uh, patients with treatment-resistant de depression and gave the two oral doses of psilocybin. Of course, we, don't, we, we cannot reduce this of just giving them the substance and then just seeing what happens. They all received psycho psychological support, pre preparation before, during, and after the session. The outcome was measured by so-called yeah, questionnaires, inventories, where you just uh, ask a, 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 an amount of questions relating uh, to uh, depressive symptoms. And well, the results are very promising. Now to the graph. This is the baseline, this is the score with which you measure how severe the depression is. So having a high score leads, means a severe depression, which is now in this graph categorized as a score over 30. Now, between nine and 30, there's a mild or moderate depression, and no depression at all would be a score under, under nine. Now, most of the people, most of these 12, 12 uh, patients came from um, severe to mild depression, and having, after, after having the high, uh, first high dose, one week after that, without repeating this high dose, as you can see, six had no depression anymore, Six had a mild depression, and even the highest ones went way down in this score. A follow-up that, uh, that was done three months later reported that most of the patients, most of the participants in this study remained in a recession from their depression. As you can see here, one of them didn't have any more a difference after th uh, three months in the in the depression catalog. But this might, might not be 
because of the substance, but because of how we fixate, how we uh, do therapy afterwards, after this uh, one high dose session. If you take a look at this and you think about how antidepressants work and how a prescription drug has to be taken every day to, to do its work, this is revolutionary. This is something incredible. You just give it one time, you provide assistance and preparation before, you give assistance and guidance through the experience, and then you provide what is called an integrative uh, uh, support to integrate this, this experience to, to everyday life. Now, this is not only happening with psilocybin, but also in this ayahuasca uh, brew with dimethyltryptamine, there was a study that showed that you also had an effect on these scores after seven days. After one dose, seven days later, you had a significant effect on this, this uh, yeah, depression, depression symptoms compared to the placebo. Making a follow up and making the, 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 the highest effect one, uh, after one day, but still keeping it down after several days. Another, another um, study, and as you see, the studies are com uh, commencing to pile up. Yeah, LSD efficacy in cancer related anxiety also showed significant, a, a significant trait towards less symptoms. One of my favorites is um, this study by Roland Griffith at the, and Matt Johnson at the um, University of John Hop uh, the John Hopkins Institute, which studied psilocybin producing uh, a substantial and sustained decrease in depression and anxiety with patients with life-threatening cancer. This was the, the comparing to the first that I presented. This is a double-blind uh, trial, so the first one didn't have any placebo group, and this one has. Now to the, to the scores. Take a look at this. You see that there are different scores. You don't, you don't, you don't have to pay that much attention to the, to the names of the scores. The most important thing to, to notice here is that you have a low dose and a high dose. And there's a score for depression. There are several scores for depression and there are several scores for anxiety and one for mood disturbance. Yeah, as you see, even the low dose had an effect, a long lasting effect, even after six months follow up from that point where the substance was given, they had an amazing decrease in their uh, depression and anxiety symptoms. The only difference that we can see in each of, and one of in all of these curves uh, is that the high dose had a more fulminant effect, meaning faster after the first uh, follow-up than the long-lasting and, and then the low, low dose still both were long-lasting i could go talking about this again and again and i could present to you so many studies but i think that will be too much and so i will keep to this last couple of uh studies um like, for example, the pilot study on this same receptor with psilocybin in the treatment of tobacco addiction, with was, which was also do, uh, done by Griffith and, and Johnson and, and John Hopkins University, and also led to a smoking cessation that was higher than ever any other kind of, of treatment has shown up until now. They are um, one of the most uh, recent papers that have been published is the positive effects of psychedelics on depression and well-being scores in individuals reporting an eating disorder. And not only that, if you take a look at this article here and what it might mean this, that this compound might uh, or does regulate neurogenesis in vitro and in vivo, which means that neurogenesis being the regeneration, the the um, the regeneration of neurons, the reproduction of neurons, the, the possibility that we have a way to reactivate the, um, the healing me mechanisms um, in, the, in, the, in the neurons, in the, in the brain. Uh, at the time that I was studying medicine, the base, basic idea was that neurons would 
not reproduce again. There, were, there, there was no neurogenesis. What this means that is that the possibilities go beyond mental health treatment, but they could also be used for neurological um, illnesses. What you might be asking yourself is, what did, did these people experience? What happened that changed their, their, their way of seeing life, their way of feeling in such a way that they wouldn't have any, any, any depression anymore or, even, or almost no symptoms? Well, if you take a look at this, this uh, graph, there's, um, this is our, these are questionnaires done uh, to people that took a, a, a low dose a uh, middle dose and a higher dose of psilocybin. And then they were asked what they experienced throughout this, this session. So of course you have the elementary visual alterations, the audiovisual synesthesia, uh, change in vivid imagery. Uh, but more interestingly, it was this report of insightfulness or religious experience, or even more so if you see the, 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 the more this, this goes to, to the outer border of the circle, the more the people reported having this. So the experience of unity, the experience of belonging to someone bigger than themselves was uh, very common among the higher doses. Also the experiences of a blissful state. And well, you might think, oh yeah, but taking psychedelics, this might be a very, very, um, yeah, challenging and, and difficult experience. Yes can be, but if you see at this, this uh, scores, the uh, score in ex and anxiety uh, wasn't all that high. So this is taking a look at the phenomenology, phenomenology of the substance effect. So this is one of the points that we can take as an explanation for the effects that they, these substances have in the mind. Now, the second approach would be taking a look at the uh, physiological effect. Yeah, and in 2016, there was this same study about the neuroimaging and taking a look at how brains react uh, while under these substances. And what you could, what you could see there is, was that here, the default mode network had a decrease in integrity. Now, a couple of words on the default mode network. This is the network where your sense of self exists. This is a very human thing, something that we need to be able to uh, have thoughts that are related to ourselves, meaning what am I going to do tomorrow? Uh, what did I do yesterday? But also we have data that people suffering from depression have an overactively default mode network. This is explainable through the idea that you are always thinking about yourself. Why did this happen to me? Why am I always so unlucky? Why, I, if, if this happened to me already, it probably will happen again. And then they just don't live in the, in the moment anymore, but they have this fixated way of neuronal, transportation of information that reinforce itself, generating the idea that they are somehow worthless or not, not yeah, worthy of uh, being happy or feeling happy. Now, back to this, this research um, and the physiological level, the decrease in integrity of the default mode network uh, under psychedelics means that you are able again, to create new connections and create new beliefs and just for just at least for just one moment, take another perspective on, on your me mental health issues. And this can, well, actually be very beneficial uh, for the treatment of depression. Summing this all up, the potential uh, therapeutic effects of psychedelics can be... Um, can we sum up with normalization of this negative bias, what, what I all, all, all just said, the reduction in rumination and thoughts that are repeating and repeating again. Also, the improvement in the patient and therapist relationship can be um, reached. There's uh, reduced uh, withdrawal in social activities and the reinstatement of reward processing addressing the addiction uh, or substance abuse disorders. Now, uh, in emotional processing, you can see that 
there's, there's a reduction of the uh, processing of negative stimuli. The amygdala, that is the part of the brain um, that takes, takes care of uh, fear, and when to have fear and when for to, fe to feel fear, this fight, flight, or freeze reaction that you, you might have heard of. Also, the self-processing part, yeah, the um, decreased, decreased self, other differentiation, yeah, but they, they deserve it, I don't, I am worse than them, and et cetera, and comparing yourself to others instead of living your, your, your best life and being the best what you, yourself you can be for yourself. And the social processing, increasing empathy, yeah, being able to swing emotionally a little bit more and be more sensitive to, to rejection. Well, so, or, or other, just a moment, I reduced rejection sensitivity. So if someone rejects you, was like, meh, I don't care. Now, the difference between the approach with SSRIs and psychedelics is being um, proposed here being that uh, this that basically I'll, I'll i'll just do it fast because i i think uh, we are we're um already too very long on um ssris lead to a, um, a decrease in limbic responsivity which means emotions uh, an increase and decreasing emotions um also leading to a decrease in stress, impulsivity, aggression, and anxiety, and increasing resilience, and emotional blunting. Emotional blunting means that your feelings and emotions are so dulled that you neither feel up nor down. You simply, you simply feel meh. People who experience emotional blunting report that they are less able to laugh or cry when it's appropriate. Um, they feel less empathy for others. They feel a loss of motivation and drive, and they are not really able to respond with the same level of enjoyment that they would normally would uh, or would like to. Of course, yes, this leads to less feeling sad, but it does not mean that it leads to feeling happier. The difference being in the psychedelics and the treatment with these substances that you uh, generate cort cortical entropy, meaning again, what I already said, that you have a better, um, better possibility to create new experiences, new connections, new thoughts, new ideas. Um, it reduces the rigid thinking, rigid thinking, for example, about yourself and about how, how much worth you are, and increases the sensitivity to your environment and emotional release, leading to well-being and really and actually being able to let loose of all that clutter that we keep dragging with ourselves. Very important is that we are, we talked already um, about how context sensitive uh, the activation through antidepressants, um, through the 5H2A receptor um, they are. It shouldn't surprise you then that serotonergic psychedelics are also strongly context sensitive. There is a huge difference in the effects and outcome when these substances are used recreationally and taken in a therapeutic context with several preparation sessions, guidance through the psychedelic experience, and integration sessions afterwards. I am not saying that these substances cannot create a beneficial outcome when used recreationally, but the risks are enormously higher when doing so for several reasons. One of all is that substances are illicit and you cannot always be 100% certain that you trusted what your trusted dealer sold you. There are predictors that state that these substances could lead to mental health issues when certain genetic predisposition exists. This is being screened before any therapeutic uh, onset happens. Being in an unstable, unstable environment can create a challenging experience and no one there with proper training to give you a hand in this state, you might end up hurting yourself or hurting others. This does not mean that challenging experiences or bad trips are something that should be avoided. These altered states, there is, in these altered states, there is uh, no way to avoid experiences. The more resistance you offer, the harder it is, it, it is going to get. In fact, most of the patients report that challenging experiences were the most beneficial for the treatment and the ones that took the most, they took the most out of. 
So the shift goes from uh, containment through an SSRI to an antidepressant so that you cannot feel anymore this feeling and you just put it away to an immersion, an immersion in the feelings, an immersion in yourself, in the perception. Um, and doing this, doing so, immersing, uh, allowing yourself to re-explore uh, this, this uh, problems or trauma with, uh, with a more open mind um, and flexible mind seems to be the answer. It's, um, yeah, forget about the idea that you can get over something. Ignoring a part of yourself won't make it go away. Most probably will come back. Sometimes dissociation happens unconsciously because the mind is not able to cope with the situation deal at the moment. So we suppress the memory and go about life as it didn't happen. This often, often creates symptoms. Another perspective is that one is the one of not letting go of something we did or was done to us so that we hold on to it and identify with it. The idea of integration is to be able to accept all the pieces of yourself and integrate experiences consciously to let go of all you don't need to hold on to to lead a healthy life. There is a wonderful paper on this uh, written by Max Wolf, um, uh, Lea Mertens, Michael Kolowski, Gerhard Grunder, and Hendrik, uh, called, Hendrik Jungawelle, called Learning to Let Go, a Cognitive Behavior Model on How to how psychedelic therapy promotes acceptance. I would recommend this to anybody interested in, in the subject. And now I am going to fly over different psychoactive substances other than classic psychedelics. For example, there is now this, um, this antidepressant that's esketamine. Esketamine and ketamine seems to be um, coming as a a uh, horse tranquilizer coming as a, a, a substance that I would use to, to do anesthesia has found that there is a use for it, not only as a nasal spray, but also um, used to augment psychotherapy in a way that we can dive into the psyche and take out, dig out the, the possible trauma that is, um, that is hidden there. MDMA, the active ingredient in the ecstasy or uh, ecstasy pills, uh, also shows uh, high potential to treat PTSD. And now jumping very fast, uh, this, these substances has been, have been used across the globe in very different traditions and different cultures. And we're just beginning, um, just, we're just beginning to bring them to the Western culture. There is even proof that is more than 6,000 years old that in Algeria, more mushrooms were part, uh, yeah, psychoactive mushrooms were part of rituals. In Mexico, Guatemala, and many South American countries, mushrooms have been part of indigenous practices with roots going back all the way to the Aztec, Mayan, and Inca cultures. In South America, as many of you know, there are several tribes and societies that use psychoactive substances as part of their culture. Now, I don't think that the goal should be here to integrate these rituals and practices into our culture. The implementation of these practices has been developed for their environment, their belief systems, and their culture. It might work for some that praise that there is no other way to take ayahuasca but to go to the Peruvian jungle, walk for three days into the jungle, and then experience these sacred rituals. But in my opinion, we should learn from these cultures, their knowledge and practices, and then translate the science behind it and create standardized treatments, treatment settings from which most patients will be able to profit, developing a concept that's specially constructed for our environment, our belief system, and our culture. These substances are very safe. They are always being projected there as being unsafe. But if you take a look at this study, um, this is the on red you see the harm to others, and on blue the harm to ourselves. Yeah, and all the way down you can see that LSD, mushrooms, ecstasy, and in the middle ketamine are on the lower part of the curve. So, yeah, they are very potent substances with low low, low amounts that are needed to create mind changing results. Now ask yourself, why are these illegal? It can be to protect us from ourselves or from our others if they are safe. Even more, if we take a look at this part and see that alcohol is the most dangerous substance that we have and tobacco over here. 
These are all preliminary studies and a lot more of research is needed. So we at the Mayan Foundation are together with the Central Institute for uh, Mental Health in Mannheim, led by Professor Gerd Grinder, uh, starting this episode study. This called, so-called episode study uh, will um, take a look at the efficacy and safety of psilocybin in treatment-resistant major depression. It will be the first of its kind, of its kind in 19, uh, since 1970 in Germany. It will be a big amount of patients, 144 participants, and it will be the, the gold standard of studies being a double-blind, randomized controlled study. Now let me take just a moment and say something about the Mind Foundation. The Mind Foundation, as it is, we envision a healthier, more connected world through evidence-based, safe and legal applications of, psychedel of the psychedelic experience. Yeah, when, when we talk about psychedelics, we talk about bringing them to society in, and creating a legal and safe framework where these experiences can be addressed openly and be beneficial, not only for patients, but also for general. So yeah, psychedelics can lead to experience to experience inner peace, reduce rumination, self-critique, and increase sense of unity and belonging. They reduce rigidity in the mental process and open openness and increase openness to new emotions and experiences. They create long-lasting changes uh, even after one session, and studies demonstrate safety and possible benefit. There is a potential beyond uh, therapy of psychiatric Ill illnesses, and if you remember Wooly, you well, basically need to be blind to not be able to recognize the potential that these substances bring. I like to think about psychedelics in therapy as, as this caterpillar, which back in the 40s didn't have the time and the protection and the, the, the ability to grow into a cocoon. So it was uh, framed like they are bad and they create these bad trips and they make people jump out of windows and make apes rape women and, and et cetera, et cetera. And now we are coming out of this cocoon. We are getting finally the possibility to become this potentially beautiful thing that could help 2.4 billion people. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. The last thing I want to say is that the future is now. Just last week, Oregon voted to decriminalize all drugs and allow psilocybin for mental health treatment. I hope now you can understand, read, uh, and enjoy knowing what this means. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sergio. It amazes me. I was I was bound to your lips. Like you can talk so with so much much passion about this topic. And thank you for that. I didn't I didn't notice the time running out so fast. So I hope we can answer a, a couple of questions. Sure, no problem. And the first question that came to my mind was um, in this presentation, you uh, you sketch a very uh, positive and hopeful and, and uh, effective side of these uh, substance, uh, substances. But when you look at media, when you look at politics, you see a very dark side of these substances. How can it be that these two worlds are so different from each other? Yes, a uh, very interesting question. And actually it is one that dates back to why they, this research was stopped in 1970s. In the 1970s, or a, a little bit before that, even the, the government, the U.S. government, started using LSD to treat, to, to, to experiment with, with um, mind control and such on their old soldiers and, and between other, other kinds of popu uh, populations. What they noticed after this was the soldiers, after experiencing these states uh, of consciousness, were not willing to fight in their wars anymore. And um, uh, if there, there was this Harvard professor that was 
having this idea to create a subculture and give psychedelics to a lot of people and then just just drop out of this of society which all generated this 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 whole uh, era of the 60s now nixon didn't didn't like that quite mo uh, quite much and he declared this one harvard professor professor doing uh, actual research with these uh, substances well and then dropping out and get going and doing that the um, the most dangerous man in america and doing so he generated and created this laws that prohibited any kind of psychoactive substance so it began it began to be difficult to to get studies approved to uh, check on these substances and see how how they worked in the mind and i don't think that politics actually and we see this again in this covid pandemic that politics don't really always listen to science Yeah, I think while you were answering that question, I immediately thought back to your presentation and you saw that the research on uh, psychedelics and these substances were very um, um, active right before that time. Like you said, in, in, in the mid 19th century and uh, then it was very active and then there was a, this period of, of nothing. And mm -hmm. right now I feel like we're changing that and it is back on the agenda and we are voting to get it back on and to get uh, ethical approval to study these substances and their therapeutic effects. Yes, so yes we are. Maybe we can look at the Q&A because I see a couple of questions and I'm curious. Um, Sandra also uh, asked a question uh, during your presentation and I thought it was a very interesting one. Um, she wants to know what your thoughts are on natural supplements such as 5-HTP uh, and L-tryptophan. Yeah, so, well, uh, these are kind of related to psychedelics. Some, um, some people that recreationally use uh, MDMA, they swear that it, this takes away their, their hangover afterwards and helps generate a lot of serotonin afterwards. Um, some patients really profit from them. I don't have a, um, a scientific basis that really uh, has studied in depth how much of this this tryptophan and the 5-HTP actually is absorbed and actually and really goes goes to the to the brain. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it's helping you, I I wouldn't stop doing it. But there's there's not not a lot of of scientific uh, based information on that. Thank you. So it is in the Netherlands at least it is available over the counter. You can buy it at any um, drugstore um and and use it so you say if it helps you if you feel that it has any potential for you go for it and not, not go for it but please use it as um as it helps you yes one thing that you have to take care of is not using it while you are taking any kind of illicit substance mm -hmm. because this can lead to an emergency situation you don't want to have which is called as uh, serotonin syndrome yes yeah yeah so very important maybe it's also good like if you are thinking about taking those supplements to contact your uh, general practitioner and talk about it if it is suitable for your situation absolutely good advice always talk to your general practitioner if you want to <laughs> take anything that is for your health i think yeah so we have another question um let me see um, do you expect this treatment through psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to be available to for every patient regardless of the level of depression or will it most likely be available for patient with treatment resistant depression very good question so yeah if we are talking um, generally about how how studies about new substances go you first get the group that doesn't have any other alternative and you give them a new alternative being this the treatment resistant depression group after you have a positive outcome in a bigger study and even better so if you have a positive outcome in several studies showing that this is a safe um, way to generate a different kind of approach to treat treatment resistant depression then the next study level goes to well what about using this as a first-line treatment for depression? 
and then the roll uh, the, and then the the uh, the circle just goes another round and then you treat and see and make uh, studies about if it's if it also helps with uh, less severe depression and i to answer your question i do expect that over the years with time with ex with more acceptance in the in the mainstream of this kind of treatments you should uh, expect to see uh, an increase of um, of indications I also mentioned the potential these substances have to even go beyond the treatment of illnesses, which is far from explored, far from, from uh, being ready, but it might be possible. I think it's very interesting to look at that because most of the, the population uh, with mental illnesses are having these uh, uh, moderate um, uh, severity of depression that's most prevalent. So that is also the largest group that can be helped. So I'm very excited to see what the future brings in terms of that. And I also saw that Lisanne just uh, asked us a very interesting question. Um, during your talk, you mostly talked about the high dose effects of uh, these substances. And what are your ideas about the longer times of microdosing? Microdosing, yeah, very popular, very exciting topic, very little information which uh, we have available, mostly because of the legal frame we're working on, mostly because these people are self-medicating, no one is giving them in studies microdoses, and this is very difficult to quantify then. There are several points of view where, where you could approach this, what is a microdose? Who is deciding if it's a microdose? When is it not a microdose anymore? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and most of the people I've talked to that do microdoses, they are, are like, yeah, and I actually, well, microdose being taken one tenth of the substance to not feel any of the effects, but have some of the um, long term benefits of them. Yeah. So you're not tripping every day, but you are um, actually just having a, a subjective um relief of cer cer certain certain symptoms of depression so very difficult to quantify who is who is um there is there's no way to to be sure what they are taking and how much they are taking most of them just dilute their their substance which they um pretty sure that most of them are not chemists doing their own lsd so mm -hmm. they don't they don't they, don't ca they cannot quantify with certainty how much they are taking. That's one of the first things. The second thing being the politicals and how are we going to quantify and um, document this. And the idea of microdosing seems a very, very interesting one. Nevertheless, we don't know actually there are signs that taking even small amounts of psychoactive substances, of certain energetic uh, psychedelics might lead to uh, heart problems in these slow doses, but for the prolonged time, there is some kind of uh, kind of action there that that might have very very, very bad side effects. Um, so I cannot recommend it. Yeah, I know that, that that there are books around it and there's there's opinions around it, but we are trying to get the data to find out if this actually has a has a potential, has a, a, a way. At the same time, it's going back to the same thing of antidepressants and giving someone something every day or every three, three days with a pause in between and whatever. But it's, this, it's the same way of substituting the antidepressants. And I really think that this, this high dose experiences can change the way you uh, see and interact with life. In one of the studies from Roland Griffith, he, um, he reported that from the, the participants, some of them said that this, this experience was the most, or if not the most, in the top five of the most significant experiences rating over the birth of their first uh, child and so. Oh. So the potency, the, the potential of these substances to create a, 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 a yeah, relaxation in the brain and the beliefs is uh, way higher than taking small amounts every day. 
Thank you. So to add on to that, I want to um, finish with my last question. I, I can talk to you about this topic for, for hours, I think, but we need, to, um, we need to take the time into account. Where do you see the future going for this field of study? I think that if I am, as I just told you before, Oregon just mm -hmm. le let the, their, their people vote and they voted for the therapeutic use of these um, substances. I think that the future will be after treating, uh, after showing, and if we show it, because we don't know it right now. Actually, we, ha we are very convinced that we are, but we don't know. And after the, the studies show that we have a positive out, outcome in um, treatment resistant depression as uh, the last, the ultima ratio, the last uh, resource to treat, to treat patients, we might go um, and revise again all of that data from the 40s and 70s and try to take another look at all these different diseases and mental health uh, problems that can also and might also be also treated with um, psychedelics. That's it. Yeah. I think it's very interesting what you've shown us today. And um, that is a good way forward that we are going, that we are opening up again about these types of studies and exploring the uh, effects that it can have on our mental health. Is there any take home message you want to give our audience for today? Do not, do not confuse recreational with therapeutic use. It's two different things. This is not a magic bullet. It doesn't heal everything. Yes. This uh, studies are being, um, yeah, overseen by professionals trained in this area. Um, that's it. Thank you for, for watching. Thank you for being here. Yeah, beautiful. I want to thank you so much for this very interesting presentation and uh, overview of uh, the research that is currently being conducted and the historical overview of um, psychotherapy and psychiatry in general. Um, I want to ask our audience, uh, no, no, I want to thank our audience as well uh, for the questions that they asked. Uh, they were very interesting and uh, have a great evening. Thank you, Laura. Yes. Have a great evening. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. <laughs>